Hi everyone, it's Robert McClemon here. This is a short video for students taking ES 102 in winter 2016 and the purpose of this video is to provide a short review of the course and to get you ready for the final exam. There's three things I'm going to be covering in this video. Uh, the first is I'll finish off uh, where we were speaking uh, last week about urban sustainability and with our guest speaker who came in on Monday from Sustainability CoLab. I'm going to be going over some of what I think are the key concepts or important ones that we covered in the course. And I'll finish up by giving a couple little uh, bits of information about what to expect on the final exam. Before you start going any farther with the video, what I suggest is you go into my learning space and open up the uh, PowerPoint deck uh, that accompanies this video. What you'll find is that on the PowerPoint slides there's actually a, uh, a number in the lower right hand corner and I'll mention the number of the slide as I go along uh, through this lecture. So, and I've got the PowerPoint going just off the, um, just off the screen in case you're wondering why I keep looking over there during this video. Okay, so when I left off we were talking about smart growth or more particularly why don't we do more smart growth when we're developing urban centers? And uh, one of the realities is that uh, if you want to call it dumb growth, in other words, uh, poorly planned growth or growth that doesn't take into account long-term sustainability, uh, it's just easier to do. It's what we've been doing for a long time and it's cheap and easy and simple to keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of people and a lot of companies and a lot of businesses make money from dumb growth uh, because they know what they're doing and uh, because it's relatively cheap and easy to implement. Um, and a lot of people actually enjoy living in the types of suburbs that we were talking about where everybody has two or three cars in their driveway, the garage is out the front, they don't have much in the way of green space or anything like that because they go from their garage to their workplace and back home and into the rec room and watch TV. So they're not particularly interested in having a uh, livable neighborhood, an interesting neighborhood or community uh, in which to participate. and But I think what is probably the biggest factor is that a lot of people have never lived in anything else, so they really don't know what they're missing. If all you've ever lived in is a beige snout house kind of beige box of a house in a subdivision, you've never lived in an interesting uh, sustainable, viable, lively city or urban environment or even suburban environment, then uh, you really don't know what you're missing. So. Um, one of the things that we need to do, and this sort of ties up the whole course, is we need to reimagine cities, which is in reality where most of us live these days, cities and suburbs. We need to reimagine them as places where food can be produced, where water is conserved, where biodiversity is protected, where walking and cycling and moving about the community without an automobile is the priority way to go, where our buildings are both functional and beautiful at the same time where we connect not just with one another within the urban setting, but where also our cities are more closely connected to rural people, to rural communities, to rural environments, through our food systems, for example, for, uh, through farmers markets, and simply places where we enjoy being, and not simply places where we have to be or find ourselves, but communities where we actually enjoy being a part of that community. And so I'm now on slide number three, uh, which is, uh, shows pictures and, and has the title Cities as Places for Food Production. You'll see the cover of a popular book about how to grow an edible front garden and you'll see an example of somebody with a vegetable garden. And this is a simple example of a movement that's going in many cities around the world in suburbs where people are getting back to having a vegetable garden uh, in the front yard or in the backyard if that's where, uh, wherever the, uh, the growing conditions are best. Something that most households had 50 or 60 years ago we got away from that in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but now people are getting back to that. It's seeing as an opportunity to, um, to grow their own foods, to produce a little bit of their own diet as well, uh, and also it's just simply an enjoyable activity. Another way to do so is, and I'm on slide four now, you can see not just in backyards, but there's no reason why we can't produce food on rooftops uh, in urban centers or in living walls uh, where we actually have uh, soil and uh, bins piled up against a south-facing wall and, uh, and grow foods there. And indeed, in the uh, geography department here at Laurier, uh, in March and April, you'll often see uh, here in the map library, we've got little seedlings going in, in trays on the uh, southeast facing windows uh, in the map library. And we grow those tomato plants and pepper plants and herbs, and we sell them off in May uh, to people around the university community in Waterloo so that they can start uh, gardens of their own. And up on the Northdale campus of Laurier, 
which is about two blocks uh, north of University Avenue, there's actually a cooperative uh, Farmers uh, are growing uh, vegetables on that campus cooperatively and you can actually purchase vegetables from them on a subscription basis. So there's lots of opportunities for us to reimagine our cities as places for food production. Another thing to think about is cities and the water or hydrological cycle. And I talked about this a little bit in last week's lecture where uh, in building cities and building suburbs what we've done is we've transformed the hydrological cycle. When rainfall used to fall on farmers fields and on forests uh, it has a very different way of running off into lakes and rivers and streams than it does when it lands on hard impermeable paved surfaces like asphalt rooftops or driveways or streets. We can redesign our cities so that that water is not just racing off hard surfaces and ending up in storm drains and with it sweeping pollutants into those into our water bodies but we can think of cities as places where we conserve water so for example uh, the classic uh, green uh, lawn in front of people's homes in the front yards there's no reason why that has to be uh, and you'll see people on a hot summer's day out there watering their front lawns there's no need for that we don't need to waste uh, water in those ways. We can have alternative landscapes in our front and backyards that don't require watering or irrigation. We can attach rain barrels or build cisterns adjacent to buildings so that rainwater doesn't just go straight into the storm sewer, but in fact um, ends up uh, being saved for when we do have a dry period, for when we do want to water those backyard or rooftop gardens that we're building. And of course inside our homes as well, uh, we can uh, install low flush toilets, uh, low uh, flow uh, shower heads and things like that, so we don't use as much water in the first place. So water conservation is something that a sustainable city does very well. Another thing that a sustainable city does is it protects biodiversity. And if you remember ES 101, there was a lab in which you walked around the Laurier campus and you charted and, and mapped places where we could enhance the pollinator habitat. We should be doing that across all of our cities, not just as labs for universities. All of our backyards, all of our city parks, even outside factories and shops and businesses, we should have space where pollinators and other native species feel right at home. Because in the end, uh, so much of our ecological diversity depends upon sharing our urban space uh, with, uh, with wild creatures. And so now I'm on the slide that says cities as places to protect biodiversity and you'll see an image of a, a very pollinator friendly backyard garden as well as a rooftop uh, garden with native plants and a beekeeper uh, up on top of that rooftop as well. I'm now at slide 8 and I'm talking about walkable cities and that is probably one of the key features of any sustainable urban center is its walkability. In other words, do pedestrians, do cyclists, do skateboarders, do people pushing baby buggies, do they get first priority over the use of the urban space? There's no reason why they shouldn't. And the idea that came about in the 1960s and 70s that cities should be dedicated uh, first and foremost to getting around by private automobile, that needs to go because it just makes no sense. It's not sustainable, it's not a good use of space, and it's a categorical a sign of, of dumb urban growth. And so in this picture what you see is Pearl Street Mall in Boulder, Colorado. One of the most livable, walkable, cyclable cities in North America. And so this is the actual uh, core of the downtown center of Boulder, Colorado. And what you can see in this image are uh, flowers, uh, gardens, places to sit, open spaces. There's even a little uh, climbing uh, playground for kids to play. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be playgrounds right in the heart of our downtown centers. Why do kids playgrounds need to be stuck only in schoolyards or in little bits of green space and parks that we stuck out of the way? There should be creative playgrounds for kids right on the main streets of our cities. Uh, that's what should take our priority and not simply parking spaces and uh, roads uh, for cars to travel down. And as you can see, there are very viable businesses lining the sidewalks of the city, uh, Boulder, Colorado as well. So we need to think outside of uh, traffic and parking spaces. Another thing we need to think about is buildings. Uh, and in urban centers, you know, we have these ideas of what urban center buildings should look like. Tall skyscrapers made, or, made of either uh, concrete or of uh, glass and steel. There's no need for them to always be like that. Our architecture should be beautiful and functional. And on slide number nine, what you see is an image of a building in Vienna, which is actually low-income housing. This is the type of housing that people of low income apply for and that the city uh, uh, provides for them. And it's been, uh, it's an old building that's been renovated by the architect uh, Friedensreich Hundertwasser. 
And so what you can see is that you've got plants growing all over it, bright colors. Inside the building, the, each apartment unit is dif different and distinct and really architecturally beautiful. There's no reason why uh, low-income housing, for example, has to be just a bunch of beige or, or cement apartment blocks. We need to, again, think of uh, the artistic form of our cities as well as the functionality of them. And then on slide 10, you see a picture of the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market just outside of Waterloo. And this is a good way that cities can connect or reconnect uh, with uh, rural populations and with rural environments and through our food supply. And so one of the great things that I like about Kitchener-Waterloo is we have two fantastic farmer's markets. The Kitchener uh, Farmer's Market is a beautiful piece of architecture that reminds me of the old uh, the old market halls in European cities and the, uh, the St. Jacob's one uh, where farmers come in from the, the areas around the community selling everything from fruits and vegetables to, to crafts. This is a great way for you as an urban dweller to actually meet the people who produce uh, your food and ask some questions. So if you're concerned about you know, uh, organic food or the use of pesticides in your food or the quality of your food, you go to a farmer's market and you speak directly to the producer and ask those questions. It builds not only uh, a sense of community, it builds social capital. And in an early lecture I talked about the food dollar and how sure you can go to Zares or Loblaws or Sobeys and buy food and you're not really sure where it comes from and the money that you pay for that food sort of disappears off into corporations and food processors and trucking companies and elsewhere. Or you can go to the farmer's market and pay the same amount of money for good quality food that's produced, that's produced locally and your food dollar stays in the community, stays in Waterloo Region and goes to support your friends and neighbors. So it's a great way for a sustainable city to uh, build a larger sense of community. And most importantly, and I'm on slide number 11 now, cities should be fun. And in this picture, what you see is Canada Day outside Kitchener City Hall, right on King Street in downtown Kitchener. And people are having fun. There's people wandering through the streets, and there's things going on, there's market displays and so on. Why is that only on July 1st? Why is it not like that every single day of the year? Ask yourself, why on the other 364 days of the year is that area dedicated to traffic and to uh, buses spewing pollution and uh, very pedestrian unfriendly. Why is it like that? Why is it not a pedestrian zone all year round, much the way it is in Boulder, on uh, Boulder, Colorado on Pearl Street Mall, for example? So cities should be fun places to be. They shouldn't just be purely functional. And these are all sort of um, ideas of what a sustainable urban center might look like. And I hope that you review those slides as part of your uh, preparations for the final exam. So now I'm on slide 12, and what I'd like to talk about is the, uh, the course review and uh, what I think are the, uh, the key challenges and uh, concepts and solutions that we talked about over the course. Over the course, I've been talking about a lot of different environmental challenges and the different sorts of approaches we could use to dealing and resolving those, uh, dealing with and resolving those challenges. One of the things I think that we have in common throughout all of these different environmental challenges uh, is that the, there's a need for uh, complete solutions. And this is a term, complete solutions, that I borrowed from the agrarian philosopher um, Wendell Berry, who uses this term in many different ways. And a complete solution is simply this, and I'm on slide 13 now, a slide that I've shown in previous lectures. Imagine a challenge that you have, whether it's the need to get to work, or the need to produce food, or the need to generate electricity. It could be an individual challenge, it could be a broad scale challenge that affects all of us. The first thing you have to do is think about, well, what are the possible responses that we could uh, implement? Uh, for this challenge. And then for each possible response, go through the benefits and costs or the benefits and new challenges that are associated with it. So if you're thinking about urban transportation, for example, uh, there are many ways to get to work each day, which is a challenge that all of us face. So there's different ways you can do it. You can walk, you can ride your bike, you can take the bus, you can buy an automobile, buy a parking space and do it those ways. And think about the benefits and the challenges that these create. So for example, if you decide to purchase an automobile and drive to work or school each day, uh, there's some benefits. You get there quickly, uh, you can stay dry during a wet day, um, and uh, you have more control over your transportation. 
The challenges, however, are that automobiles are very bad for the planet in terms of air pollution that they create, in terms of traffic congestion that they create uh, in our communities, and they go against the idea of a sustainable city. The other thing is if you spend a lot of time sitting behind the wheel of a car, your health will suffer. And so if you look at that uh, as a possible response, buying an automobile, you'll see that you've, you've created new challenges even though you've sort of solved your temporary problem of having to get to work each day. So that's not a complete solution. Whereas if you decide that you're going to walk or ride your bike or even take public transport, uh, there's many benefits. You still get to work each day. If you're walking or riding your bike, you also get the benefit that you're probably going to be healthier than if you spend each day uh, behind the wheel of an automobile. And the number of new challenges are relatively few, right? Uh, I suppose on slippery days you'll have to uh, be careful when you're walking. Then again, you can buy uh, little cleats or uh, 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 spikes that you strap on to your boots when you're walking so you won't slip. So that can be overcome fairly easily. Same with your bicycle. If it's really bad weather, then you can switch to the bus. In other words, a complete solution to the problem or challenge of getting to work each day, there are options that create very few environmental, social, or economic uh, problems that are new. And so that would represent a complete solution, commuting by bike or, or by walking. So that's just one example of how you can use this uh, simple, simple concept on how to organize thoughts, including on how to respond to questions on the final exam. So let me remind you what we talked about uh, during the course. Now, there were many environmental challenges that we talked about. There's many more we didn't. We didn't, for example, talk about soil erosion. We didn't talk about chemical contamination of the landscape in any great detail. We talked a little bit about it in the context of food systems, but there's lots of other environmental challenges out there uh, that we could have talked about. But what we did do is we started on day one, lecture one, with a brief lecture where I talked about the oil spill uh, caused by the crash of the Exxon Valdez tanker ship in Alaska back in the 1980s. Now, um, there's a, a good example of something that happens on a regular basis. And I mentioned how oil spills are a very common phenomenon, not just from tanker ships, but also from pipelines and from uh, rail transportation and other ways that we get uh, oil from uh, where it's produced to where it's consumed. And, you know, there's lots of things we can do to reduce oil spills, from safer tankers to greater uh, inspections to greater government regulations, but none of these are complete solutions, right? Um, I mean, the reality is this. If people didn't co uh, did not consume so much uh, oil and gas and petroleum products in the first place, then oil companies would not be up there in the high Arctic digging and pumping and drilling away to get at that oil because it wouldn't be worth their economic while to do so. So if we want to avoid having oil spills in fragile environments, a complete solution is to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels and move away to alternative energy. I'm now on slide 15, in which I'm talking about our second lecture that we had, which is a reminder of the ever, uh, environmental impacts of everyday choices that we make. And I talked about the Tim Hortons Double Double Coffee and how if it's purchased uh, and consumed in a paper cup with a plastic lid, it's essentially an ecological disaster in your hand. Uh, and so we went through and, and uh, deconstructed all the different components in a double-double. And so the question becomes, well, we still want coffee. We still want a caffeinated beverage in the morning. What is a complete solution to that? Well, step one might be to buy your coffee from a shop that sells organic coffee. And we, review, we reviewed the reasons why organic coffee is preferable to the stuff that they stick in a Tim Hortons cup and bring your own mug to that shop so that you're not creating unnecessary waste of the paper cup and, uh, and the plastic lid as well. Step two in a complete solution is to take that uh, logic and apply it not just to Tim Hortons coffees, but to everything that you consume, whether it's food or clothing or anything else, is to apply a logic where your consumer choices are creating environmental benefits and are contributing to complete solutions and not creating uh, new problems like additional waste or land degradation in other countries and things like that, right? So there's uh, some of the ways that we can implement uh, complete solutions and avoid ecological problems to our everyday consumption choices. I'm on slide 16 now, which uh, is labeled Global Problem, Global Action. And this was the first environmental challenge that we really got into in great depth in this course. And it was the, the problem of ozone depletion. And it was a problem that everybody around the world was contributing to, but especially consumers and producers in developed countries where uh, CFCs and other ozone-depleting substances 
were being used in large quantities. And a complete solution was found for this problem and it's underway and it's still underway to this day, which is the global community got together, negotiated a treaty called the Vienna Convention and put into place a protocol called the Montreal Protocol in, and through these, uh, these international agreements, the countries around the world agreed that they were going to get rid of uh, ozone depleting substances and replace them with more environmentally friendly substances. And that has worked and it is going on uh, to this day. And so on slide 17 you actually see on the y-axis production of ozone depleting substances on the y-axis uh, and on the x-axis you see from the 1990s when uh, the process of uh, the Vienna Convention and Montreal Protocol got underway through to the mid-2000s you can see that global uh, ozone depleting uh, substance production declined steadily over that time. It worked and if you review your notes from those lectures you'll know why it worked. The second problem we talked about was greenhouse gas emissions. And in many ways it has similarities to the ozone, depleting, uh, pro ozone depletion problem, but it has uh, distinct challenges as well. And we don't have a complete solution underway yet. People have come up with ideas on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, such as both through consumption changes, uh, encouraging people to use uh, less greenhouse gases, but also through global treaties like, uh, like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and uh, the Kyoto Protocol, but these, uh, these attempts to deal with greenhouse gases have not res uh, resulted in complete solutions. And there's two main reasons that we can boil it down to as to why it doesn't. One is that, first of all, the people who are most responsible for the problem, consumers in Western countries, that is, you and me, we create most of the greenhouse gas emissions around the world either directly through our consumption or through the processes that uh, are necessary to make our consumption patterns possible. We, we create most of the problem but we don't feel personally threatened at this point in time by the consequences of climate change. The, the big impacts of climate change and the ones that we're seeing right now are taking place for example in the Arctic, uh, in the mountains. Uh, and in small island states and developing nations in other parts of the world. Your average urban or suburban Canadian really is not yet feeling the direct impacts of climate change and so we don't have that impetus to want to go out and do something about it. Whereas with ozone depletion, scientists were able to say to the international community, if we don't take action now, there's going to be some serious public health risks in the very new, near future. And so that was a big enough catalyst for, uh, for industries and for government to start dealing with the problem. It also helped that um, there, were good uh, there were good substitutes for ozone depleting substances. We were able to come up with new chemicals other than CFCs that, uh, that could do the same job. Well, the challenge number two and the second reason why we have trouble coming up with a complete solution for greenhouse gas emissions is that fossil fuels are cheap and easy to use and we enjoy too much the benefits that we get from them. You know, it is still cheaper and easier to buy a gasoline-powered automobile than it is to buy an electric automobile. Uh, and it's more convenient, quite frankly, to drive around in an automobile than it is to take public transit in North America. Especially because public transit in North America is not nearly as good as it could or should be. In Europe, where they have excellent public transit, not many people actually own a private automobile. Or if they do, they own one, and it's a very small one with a very small engine because fuel's expensive and public transportation is cheap. So the two main reasons why we don't have a lot of action yet towards a complete solution on greenhouse gas emissions is that uh, we don't feel the immediate urgency to do so in countries like Canada and the United States and we uh, get too many benefits so far uh, from doing the things that we've already been doing. And so on slide 19 what you can see is that greenhouse gas emissions have been rising steadily uh, especially in the 20th century and especially since the 1950s. Green, uh, current carbon dioxide levels in the air are well, are, are, have increased over 400 parts per million, which is well beyond anything that we've experienced in the past uh, several hundred thousand years. So that will have long-term consequences for the planet, and we talked about some of the impacts and adaptations that will be necessary. Another thing we talked about was our energy uh, use and our energy sources, particularly how we get electricity, for example, how we get transportation fuels as well. Again, the reality is that fossil fuels are relatively cheap and very efficient in terms of combustion. Uh, it's uh, very easy to travel a long distance on a liter of gasoline, which, by the way, is still cheaper than a liter of Coca-Cola, a liter of Pepsi, a liter of even orange juice and things like that. 
And when you look at the environmental challenges that we talk about in this course, a lot of them are tied directly to our fossil fuel consumption. Uh, whether we're talking about global warming, whether we're talking about air pollution, whether we're talking about acid rain or acid precipitation, the burning of fossil fuels is at the heart of it. Now there are some alternatives and we talked about those. We talked about hydroelectric dams, we talked about uh, solar power, we talked about uh, wind turbines, we talked about nuclear power. Nuclear power is an example of a source of electricity that here in Ontario we've invested a lot of money uh, in that uh, source of electricity. And one thing that nuclear power plants do is they generate a ton of electricity in one place at one time. And once you get them going, they're very reliable. But they're not a complete solution to our energy needs. For example, uh, what do we do with nuclear waste? Uh, we haven't really figured out a safe way uh, of dealing with that. Uh, and uh, some people are very suspicious about nuclear power, especially after the Fukushima disaster a few years back where a nuclear power plant contaminated a large area in Japan. So when you think about our energy needs, neither fossil fuels nor nuclear energy provide a complete solution to our energy needs. So a lot of uh, attention is going these days into alternatives, looking at other ways of generating electricity. And each one of them so far that we've come up with has its benefits and its limitations. And in the class I actually went through all the benefits and limitations of each one of these different uh, types of energy. Wind energy is great so long as the wind is blowing. Turbines don't work when the wind isn't blowing. Solar panels are awesome, uh, but they only work during the daytime. So there's lots of uh, challenges associated with uh, alternative energy. But what's important is they're getting more common, they're getting more efficient, and they're getting cheaper. And the price of electricity generated by uh, solar panels is increasingly competitive with uh, energy or electricity that's generated through other forms, uh, through burning natural gas or from nuclear plants. So as uh, alternative generated electricity becomes cheaper, more and more people are going to start switching to it. Transportation fuel is a bit more of a challenge because right now the easiest way to power a private uh, automobile is through uh, gasoline. There are electric cars on the market. They work very well. The challenge right now is that they're more expensive than gasoline powered automobiles and their range is limited. It's really difficult to commute from Kitchener to Toronto and back again using electric car unless you have somewhere to recharge your battery uh, in Toronto during the day. But that is changing. Battery power is getting better and the efficiency of electric cars is getting uh, better each year. So probably within the next 10 to 20 years we'll reach the point where electric cars are a preferable choice uh, to uh, gasoline powered automobiles. So uh, we're on the pathway to a complete solution for fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions but until we get cheap alternatives uh, to fossil fuel based transportation we're going to have a hard time getting to that complete solution. So that's the next step in our evolution. Related to the burning of fossil fuels, I talked about air pollution. Uh, and I talked about smog and acid deposition and mercury contamination of the air. And one of the things that we uh, realized in these lectures is that in many cases it's a question of disproportionality. In other words, certain industries or certain point sources of air pollution are clearly identifiable and are more responsible for the problem uh, than others. And so there are some intermediate steps we can use to get to, uh, to complete solutions. One is to impl implement regulations as was done in Sudbury uh, so that the emissions from the uh, nickel smelters at INCO uh, became cleaner over the course of time and created less uh, acid rain. Uh, we can put in price, uh, prices on pollution and cap and trade systems so that people who want to have heavy industries and who want to uh, make pollution have to pay the true price of that. And I mentioned how, for example, in the United States there has been a market for uh, sulfur dioxide emissions for many years now that works very efficiently. In other words, if you have an industry that creates, um, that creates sulfur dioxide pollution, you need to buy a permit uh, for it and these permits can be bought and sold so that if you end up uh, investing in your company to be more efficient and to produce less, produ uh, produce less pollution you can sell that permit to another company so there's a financial incentive for investing in cleaner technology. These again are all steps on a complete solution but at the end of the day again the real complete solution is to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels so that we're not creating so much air pollution in the first place. In the next part of the course, I started talking about water pollution and some of the things that we do to cause it. 
And, uh, you know, when you think about it, water is one of the key limiting factors, both in nature and for human societies. If a city or a rural community does not have a reliable source of water, uh, it won't survive over the long term. And uh, water supply is really quite delicate and fragile. I mean, there's lots of water out there, but uh, you can run out of it very quickly and unexpectedly. And if you contaminate it, if you pollute it, uh, it can be very difficult to clean up. And the ecological and human health consequences can be very severe uh, when that happens. And so for a complete solution for water, you have to start from the basic premise that if water is our most valuable resource, then we have to treat it as such. And yet how many people actually think of water in those terms? So in, t in terms of coming up with a complete solution to deal with water and produ uh, protecting water and avoiding water pollution, we have to conserve its use. We have to protect our natural waterways and our groundwater as well. We have to uh, dispose of our wastewater properly. And not just here, but we also have to help uh, people in poor countries do the same. Because the reality is that uh, effective and responsible wastewater treatment is expensive and technologically sophisticated. And not all people around the world and not all countries around the world have the necessary resources to carry that out. So there's an interest in, uh, among all people uh, in ensuring that everyone has access to clean water and, and good sanitation. We next in the course moved on from water to talk about food systems and some of the challenges that arise from our modern industrial food system. Now, um, the way things work right now with our food system, in one sense, it's never been better. Uh, here in North America and, uh, and in other developed countries, we have tremendous amounts of food available to us and on a sort of household basis, we have never paid less uh, for our food. The, the amount of household income spent on food has dropped by about 50% uh, since the days of our grandparents. So that's a tremendous outcome, a tremendous benefit from modern industrial food production. But there are still some challenges. One is the challenge of entitlement. There are still people in this world who go hungry each day, who don't have enough food to eat, who don't get enough high quality calories, and yet at a global scale we produce more than enough food to feed everybody well. So complete solutions to dealing with the global scale food challenges uh, are ones that deal with, uh, at, with the problem of social inequality and poverty. So in other words, more development related issues than simply technological issues. The second set of problems or challenges that we have with the food system are problems of ecology. And I'm on slide 24 now if you're following along. And the problems of ecology are uh, the impacts on water quality, on soil quality, on biodiversity. When we plant monocultures of nothing but soybeans or nothing but corn or nothing but coffee beans, that has impacts. Those monocultures do not exist naturally uh, in nature. Nature does not uh, tolerate uh, monocultures for any length of time. So to make monoculture agricultural production possible, we have to add a lot of chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, chemical herbicides, and use a lot of machinery and burn a lot of fossil fuels. And so uh, when we do that sort of agricultural production, we have negative consequences for the environment. So moving towards a complete solution in terms of our food systems means embracing more largely local food production. As I talked about earlier, in purchasing our food more and more if possible from local, surf, uh, local sources, from producing some of our own food in our backyards and in our green spaces in urban areas, and to be uh, more open in our communications about what goes into our food, uh, the quality of food uh, that we're eating, and what we want out of our food system. So there's a lot of steps on the way to a complete solution to get to a sustainable food system. Related to that, and I, I talked briefly about this at the end of the food systems lectures, was uh, how we get food from the oceans and from lakes, uh, essentially our fish and our seafood. What's happening around the world is that we're rapidly depleting uh, our global stocks of larger fish and we're eating our way down the marine food chain. Uh, where once we would eat large tuna and marlin and sailfish, we've depleted those species so we're eating smaller fish species. And uh, so what's happened is, is that we're changing the ocean's biodiversity. To compensate or to uh, increase our production of fish and uh, seafood, one of the ways we've been doing this is to increase or, sorry, maricultural production. In other words, fish farms, growing fish, the way we would uh, raise livestock or produce, uh, produce crops. Um, and aquaculture is rapidly replacing 
uh, wild-caught uh, fish stocks in the global food supply, but it brings its own ecological problems, challenges related to water quality, uh, to biodiversity loss, and we reviewed some of those uh, as well. Then at slide 26, um, we're talking about municipal solid waste, which was one of the, the last uh, glo uh, one of the last ecological uh, challenges that I talked about in the course. And uh, one of the things that uh, we saw very quickly, and you see this in your textbook, is that more than 75%, in fact, more than 80% of the waste that we produce here in North America consists of material that can easily be compo uh, composted or that can easily be uh, recycled. Uh, so when you look at our waste stream and the pie charts that you see on this slide, you know, 40% of the waste we produce is organic waste, you know, food waste and things like that. Easily composted, easily diverted from landfills. Uh, the next big uh, uh, component of our waste stream is paper waste. Again, easily recycled, no need to landfill it. Same with plastic, same with glass, same with metal. Plastic's a little bit more challenging to recycle for a variety of reasons that we talked about in the class. But the point is that if you add up the organics, the paper, the glass, the metal, the plastics, that's more than 80% of the waste we produce. And it's all uh, stuff that we can avoid landfilling, that we can avoid incinerating, that we can uh, recycle and reuse. And yet when you look at our statistics, uh, the average city, Waterloo Region for example, the average city in Canada only diverts or re, uh, recycles about 50% of its waste. So we're putting way too much waste unnecessarily into landfills. So what we need to do is to come up with complete solutions and they all start with reduction uh, and reuse and recycling, those three R's that you were taught back in grade three. Uh, we still don't do a very good job of that. We need to get on with it. And now I'm at slide 27. I'm sort of coming full circle to, uh, now to what I started this uh, video lecture with, which is the, que uh, the question of sustainable cities. It's where most humans now live. Over half the human population now lives in cities or suburbs or in large towns. It's our habitat, in other words, the urban environment. So it's time to start thinking systematically about what we want that habitat to look like. Do we want our habitat to consist of nothing more than cheaply built beige boxes sprawled across former farmers, uh, former farmers' fields? Or do we want it to be the kinds of planned communities, the kind of sustainable communities where it's fun to live? where we get around easily uh, on, our, uh, on our own two feet, on bicycles, where we know our neighbors, where we can have fun uh, without having to hop in the car and drive across town. So do we want to go towards the sustainable cities? So the take home message from this course, the final thing that I want to get across is, is that the world's environmental challenges, whether they're at a global scale or at a local scale, they demand complete solutions. Uh, you know, sticking band-aids on problems and stopgap solutions aren't going to solve the world's environmental challenges. And complete solutions start with intelligent people like yourselves making intelligent decisions on a daily basis and not simply saying, well, the government needs to do something or people need to be better educated about the environment. We know that stuff. But complete solutions to the, globe, uh, the world's environmental challenges start with people like you and me on a daily basis making intelligent decisions about our consumption patterns and what we want the world around us to be like. So the challenge for you leaving this course is what are you going to do about it? What's your future going to look like? And I encourage you to take control of that future. So that winds up my review of what I think were some of the most important concepts and topics that we talked about in the course. I would of course uh, ask you to review your course notes and to reread the textbook chapters uh, more carefully in preparation for the final exam. That'll be essential. I'm on slide 29, uh, 29 now in the power pack, uh, PowerPoint pack and uh, it talks about the, the final exam and its components. There's going to be 10 multiple choice questions and there's going to be 12 short answer questions on the exam. Of the short answer questions you can pick the 10 that you feel most comfortable answering. And the multiple choice and the short answer questions will be based on content that we've covered since the midterm test. So stuff that happened before the midterm test won't be tested on those two parts of the exam. The end of the exam, or the third component of the exam, is one long answer question. And what I'm going to do in that question is give you a real world environmental scenario, something that's actually taking place right now that was in the news in the last couple weeks. Um, and I'm going to tell you about that scenario and you're going to have some options on what you think ought to be the uh, responses that we take. 
Uh, now, there will be no right or wrong answer uh, for this question. There are many possible opportunities uh, that uh, emerge from it and many possible ways or avenues that you might take to answering the question. The key thing to succeeding on this question is to make sure that you uh, use details uh, in, it, in your answer. So don't just answer in generalities about, well, the government ought to do something or we need to educate people. Talk about specific details from, from concepts that you learned in the course uh, with um, making connections to other environmental challenges that we talked about in the course and how those were solved. And so in other words, give me details. Use this as an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to really show off what you've learned from reading the textbook and from taking the course. Try to wow us uh, when we're grading your exams. Try to wow me in terms of, uh, you know, look at you know how well I can dissect this problem and deconstruct it, think about it in a systematic fashion, and offer some genuine solutions to the problem. So it's your opportunity to shine, in other words. So that pretty much wraps up my uh, final lecture, which is by video uh, for this course. I've really enjoyed uh, this course. I hope that you've enjoyed coming to class and doing the labs as well. And if you get a chance to say hello to me on campus uh, over the course of coming years in your uh, academic career, please do so. Thanks a lot and good luck on your final exam in all your courses.